Hello, I'm Wade Hudson. And I'm Cheryl Willis Hudson. Welcome to Just Us And, a series of conversations with creators of books for children and also those who get books into the hands of readers. Today, we're chatting with our dear friends, George and Burnett Ford. When it comes to diversity, inclusion, and equity in children's book publishing, George Ford and Burnett Ford are pioneers. George began his career in children's publishing in the early 1970s. In 1974, he became the first winner of the Coretta Scott King Award for illustrations for the book Ray Charles, written by Sharon Bell Mathis. He has illustrated books by Nikki Grimes, Nikki Giovanni, Eloise Greenfield, and is an important member of the Just Us Books family. Burnett is an editor, writer, and former executive whose career spans more than 40 years in children's book publishing. That's true. Through her own imprint, Just For You Books, and with major publishers such as Scholastic and Grasset Dunlap, she has helped to launch the careers of many writers and illustrators, including writers and illustrators of color. Welcome, George and Burnett. Thanks for joining us. And uh, listen, guys, it has been a long journey, hasn't it? Oh, it certainly has. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we, we <laughs> see all this gray hair out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think our paths crossed um, in the mid 1970s, right? That's correct. That's correct. Um, Katura was a baby, and was Stephen born yet when we first no, met? No, no. I didn't think so. No, no. Yeah. We met at, um, did we meet at Black Creators for Children? Or in Zynga, the in Zynga Society. And um, Black Creators for Children. Black Creators. Around the same time. Yeah. 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 Well, that uh, was, those were the days we were young. <laughs> really, really young. None we of had a lot of energy. <laughs> we did a lot of all-nighters. Um, we were doing the magazine, remember? And then we did the journal for the Nzinga Society, and George did the design and paste up. Yeah, we did and, uh, the, uh, Watoto. I mean, those were right. really, really uh, formative years. But do you think you chose uh, children's book publishing, or did it choose you? And that's a question for, for both of you. Oh, I definitely wanted to work in children's books. And when I got out of college, I started looking for jobs. I didn't know a thing about publishing. <laughs> but um, I contacted like four or five publishers and um, Random House gave me an audition. I mean, a, what do you call it, interview? Mm -hmm. And um, they hired me as an editorial assistant in training. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Long and um, yeah, what long time, you, 72. The fact is, I, I would say that the whole civil rights movement and the whole uh, the advancement of, advancement of uh, black uh, creators in children's books actually found me. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that I was going to be an illustrator, an ordinary illustrator, finding work in uh, among among the uh, the magazines and other commercial things, uh, along with other black uh, young artists. Uh, because there were no black artists in the field generally. Right. But then in 1969, uh, I met Mel Williamson at uh, Viking Press. And I was- He I, was an art director. Uh, he was art director at Viking Press, one of the few black art directors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, he was glad to meet me, I was glad to meet him. And one of the first projects we did was in 1969. This is before I did any children's books. 69. Uh, I did one book, Freddie Found a Frog. That was a children's book? That was a children's book, yeah. right. Yeah. And it was right at the same time that John Steptoe did Stevie. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. These were the first children's books with black children as the stars mm -hmm. and the images, mm -hmm. real black children. Mm -hmm. right. Snowy Day had been done two years before, but that was really a lot of people uh, thought that that didn't look as realistic as, as the ones that we did. Mm -hmm. So I would say that Tom Feelings, who was the best known artist at the time, he and I thought that we all should know each other. And on a memorable night in 1969, we met Leo and Diane Dillon at their new home that they were building. 
uh, Leo Cardi, who's gone now, a lot of the artists who started dropped out because they had families to support and there was no work. But we must remember that the real pioneer in black uh, illustration for children was Tom Felix. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he and Pat Cummings and uh, were the ones who were, had the idea of us knowing each other. And that's what led to the formation of what later became the Black Creators for Children. Right, right. They were the driving forces behind that. Right. Yeah, I was so, going to ask you, um, during those early days, there were so few um, people of color involved in, in publishing. Um, and you sort of touched upon the fact that you all came together to support each other. How important was that during those early days that you had the support of others who were trying to get in the industry? Because it had to be a lonely, lonely kind of experience. I would not have stayed in the industry if it were not for Black Creators for Children because not only was it lonely, but it was very isolating. I mean, you know, there were nice folks in the publishing company, but they were all white and nobody was coming from my experience. Mm -hmm. So to find, um, when Tom invited me to join Black Creators for Children, actually it was uh, Valerie Flournoy, who was at the time an uh, editorial assistant also mm -hmm. at Dial. Mm -hmm. She uh, knew Tom because Tom was publishing at Dial and the word got around and that's how, that's how the organization, the group was formed. Um, in, the, in those early days um, uh, in Black Creators for Children, there was a magazine, there were workshops, uh, there was a, a newsletter called Watoto uh, for right. Children. Uh, I joined that group in the mid-70s, so it had been around for a little while, sort of on the end of uh, that time period. Um, mm -hmm. What kinds of, that was kind of the precursor for kind of some kinds of criteria for how do, how do you draw black people? How do you get more black people in the industry? What we, was really, we really wanted um, there to be authentic stories and authentic illustrations. And so one of the missions of Black Careers for Children was to come up with these criteria, um, which we worked on for a long time, but I think we did, I think we got it together and, um, and people, we try to disseminate people. And once we got going, we had more and more members joining up and asking about it. And, you know, it just spread. The word spread. It's important, it's important to understand what it was really like, what it felt like. Uh, Black Creators for Children was not an organization to, uh, to uh, uh, well, how can I put it? We were preparing ourselves. We were we were professionals because we knew we were good. Mm -hmm. We were preparing ourselves. We didn't have work. I mean, some of us were working, but we did not have uh, a, 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 a real goal of we'll get this job or that job or that. The other. We were preparing ourselves. And what really happened was that uh, the, the publishers, art directors, because librarians and parents were demanding more books with black images. Mm -hmm. They sought us out. Mm -hmm. So we were there. Mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, publishers did not know us, but they knew Tom, yeah. they knew of Tom. Yeah. And so and uh, we were ready. And Tom. the important thing to remember is we were preparing ourselves and we were ready. Mm -hmm. So when the, when, when the call came, I know the, uh, an art director I never heard of called me to do a book called Ray Charles. Right. Because and they, they, they had heard about us. Mm -hmm. So, so was, the that, movement, that, that, the that, movement that, came to us. Yeah, the movement yeah. came to us. Wow. Yeah. George, George, talk a little bit more about Tom Fields because you've mentioned his name uh, a few times in Burnett as well. Um, maybe just share a little bit more about how important he was. The at, fact mm -hmm. is that um, there are a number of names that you may have heard of artists who were fine artists, but they did work, some had did exhibitions and, and some uh, were, Tom was one of those young men in the, I would say late 50s, early 60s, he was quite young, who mm -hmm. actually got a little bit of work working for Look Magazine, doing illustrations, line drawings and so on. Mm -hmm. He was the first artist that I knew well that did commercial things and steadily. Before him, Elton Fax was a well-known name, printmaker, 
Ernie Critchlow had done a book, had done books earlier, mm -hmm. but he, th these were artists who had just done books. They were not book artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of them, believe it or not, were Brooklynites. I was a Brooklynite. Tom was a Brooklynite. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Fulton Art Fair is, must be remembered, it, 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 not remembered, <laughs> most people never heard of it, but in the 50s, uh, Hale Woodruff. Uh, Don't go back too far. Okay. Uh, I want to just add uh, something about the, Tom. The, the, yeah, uh, this, I want to say, okay. this, okay. Is, the, this is the the root of it. Jacob Lawrence knew everybody. Tom knew Jacob Lawrence. I knew Jacob Lawrence. Right. And now they were local people. We knew they were artists. And uh, Norman Lewis, others, uh, Ernie Critchlow, they were interested in getting book, things into children's hands, paintings. Uh, they, Tom did posters so that every house would have a poster. He did it cheaply. So that's how I knew Tom. They, every year, the, the Fulton Art Fair uh, took place in Fulton Park, on Fulton, on Fulton Street outdoors, mm -hmm. similar to Greenwich Village. And that's where I saw all this work. That's when I said, you know, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I, I was a teenager, well, a little older than that, but basically. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, that, that, that's an interesting thing, George, that you're talking you about. Know, I just wanted to make a, a point about that too. Yeah. But it's about the, the craft. I mean, you were skilled as paint, the, Jacob Lawrence, obviously, is right. very famous uh, as a painter, um, and people doing commercial art, transitioning into uh, getting exactly. the fine art uh, into the that's hands Tom. of kids yeah, through Tom. picture books. Yeah. yeah, that's Tom. Yeah, yeah. and, and don't, Tom, don't. Tom was a magnanimous person. I mean, he was really, he was really, least, yeah. he he wanted everybody to come together. He was kind, yeah. he kind of had a mission in his head, you know. And yeah. so yeah. when we would have our meetings, when we started meeting at the Harlem State Office Building, we had a lot more space. He was always asking people to come, come in, give a workshop. Um, some of the people who were there had never had anything published, but they were there to learn, you know, the craft. So, um, but Tom was just a driving force. Yeah, he was and, an activist. And he That's was right. an activist, absolutely. Yeah. And he had, he, with his first couple of picture books, um, Jumbo means hello. Jumbo means hello. And um, what's the other one? Mo Moja means Moja one. Means one. one. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Swahili counting books. Yeah, those those books were so well received yeah. by librarians, reviewers, got prizes. I mean, Tom became really well known. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Um, and he didn't do that many books over the course of the years that we knew him. Um, because he was working on his magnum opus. Yep, we yes, have the middle passage. The middle passage, yeah. 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 Right. Tom is an important, I just want to add this. Tom is an important story, but for us, the important thing is the community of artists. Mm -hmm. right. The important thing is what was the force that kept us together mm -hmm. and helped us support each other. And right. you have to mention Pat Cummings, because That's Pat it. Cummings is a born organizer. Okay. She just has that instinct. And she's, she, she is one person who could do a number of books and still get everybody together. Right, let them right, know right. Happening, Let them know what was happening, organize and, 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 and further the movement, further the movement. That's mm -hmm. Pat. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very important to mention that because she helped Tom organize the portfolio examination mm -hmm. uh, uh, initiative where students, uh, black art students, were invited to bring their portfolio, portfolios for us to look at. Right, so, right, right, right. You know, she's, so, still, she's still doing that same kind of thing with SCBWI and her yeah, classes yeah. at Pratt and at yeah. Parsons. So it, yeah. it, it's a wonderful yeah. movement kind of thing, an, an activist artist. Uh, but yeah. Burnett, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your role as an executive because it's I think changed in publishing, you need the creators, but you need those executives. You need people to make the decisions about what should be published and how it should be published. Can you tell us a little well, bit? I, I wasn't an executive at that point in my career, you know, those early days, mm -hmm. but I was, you know, the, the editorial meetings were, you know, the whole editorial department was there and you would bring your projects that you wanted to present to, I was at Random House. That was my first job in publishing. Um, it was a hard, it was a hard row, you know, to hoe. We, um, I, a couple of times I would bring 
something to the meeting and people would say, oh, well, you know, black folks don't buy books. So that's probably not going to work for us. Um, it was like, you know, there was a lot of that. That was, there was a lot of that going on at the same time. This was 1972. I started there and I was there until 79. Um, when I, you know, I got, I moved up as I moved along. I worked at Golden Books for four years, and then I went to Grosset and Dunlap for six years. Um, I remember uh, the bringing of, I was doing a photographic book with a photographer, a white photographer, about horses. And um, we proposed a cover. One of the kids, one of the models he used with the horses was a black girl. And we brought the cover, you know, there's a cover meeting where you go and, and you know, editorial and sales and marketing are all going to comment. Um, oh, no, we can't have a black girl on the cover. Mm -hmm. No, she's beautiful, but um, people won't buy the book. They'll think it's a black book. Mm -hmm. So we had to go and do another cover. I mean, that was the kind of thing that happened all the time. And when I reached a certain point, when I got to Scholastic and I was an executive editor and a vice president, I had a lot more freedom mm -hmm. to do the kinds of books that I wanted to do. I was able to bring Just Us Books to Scholastic mm -hmm. and, um, and work with you all on a number of titles yep. that I published at Scholastic. Mm -hmm. um, the Baby Board Books, the... Um, yeah, no, yeah, uh, yeah. No, those books were what, really... What a Baby Books. The yeah. What a Baby yeah. Books, yeah. right. Good baby, good night, yeah. baby. Yeah. And um, we had a Christmas book, a whole Christmas in your heart. Was that our yeah, book? Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had, a, we had a number of we had a number of titles that did well for us. So that was, um, you know, when I just I, I decided to go out on my own as a packager after um, after the after the World Trade Center fell. I mean, I was on I was up on the Manhattan Bridge on a subway train looking at the thing you know on fire and i when we finally landed when the, our subway car finally uh stopped at canal street and made everybody get off that was when the towers were falling mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. and the cloud came up canal street i will never forget it it was like a mushroom cloud and i thought i'm not gonna be here in this city away from my husband away from my family when you know the next one comes so um, I made it up in my mind at that point that I would work on starting my own company. In and, Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, at home. Yeah. <laughs> From Brooklyn. home. Yeah. So, um, but I was, gonna, I was not going to do publishing. Packaging, where mm -hmm. I would prepare the books for the publisher. And one of my first contracts was the Just For You books, which were right. original paperback readers, easy mm -hmm. readers, all illustrated and written by people of color. Right, and, right. Um, the assignment was for 24 books. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of books to do. Yeah. 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 Um, but we but, um, your, who are your writers? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's yeah. right. We had oh, a lot of people. I mean, found new writers as well as some of the yeah. you know, yeah. well-known yeah. writers. Some were not so sure they wanted to do something with us, but then Scholastic. It was being done for Scholastic, so mm -hmm. they were going to be the publishers. So we, we got some really good people, and the books were fabulous. I yeah. still go back and look at those books. Yeah. They were yeah. all, you know, six by nine, paperback, 32 mm -hmm. pages, but... Um, Affordable and ex accessible. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Accessible. Yeah. And when, you, when you look at um, publishing today, Mm -hmm. um, particularly in terms of diversity, inclusion, and equity, uh, what does the, the lands landscape look uh, like to you guys? And, and then the second part of the question is, what vision do you have for the industry in terms of being more inclusive? Mm -hmm. well, well, you guys are the people who are doing the um the footwork you know to to bring uh, diversity to the publishing industry um my vision now i mean i'm retired i i want to write more um i i definitely i mean we're 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 on the down slope of this great movement and when i look around now when i see publishers weekly pw 
how many reviews and how many um, black books are being published. I can't believe it. I mean, it's huge numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we first started, um, what's the, uh, what was the name of the, um, the uh, KT Horning's organization up there? In the CCBC. Um, CCBC, right. Yeah. They used to compile every year a list of, they would receive every book that every publisher did, every mm -hmm. children's book, and they would, they compiled a list of those that were written in, or illustrated by African American people, right. uh, Latinos, Native Americans, mm -hmm. and when we saw the numbers, I mean, you know, there might be 5,000, 10,000 by the time um, I was, you know, ready to get out of the business, books published per year, and the numbers of black books was like, you know, minuscule. Yeah, a yeah. few hundred. Yeah, it's yeah, changed. Finished, yeah. It's changed. That I definitely have to say that things have improved. Yeah. Um, and you can find African American artists exactly. and Latino. And they've won exactly. Calvacott and Newberry and Coretta exactly. King and all of those awards, Siebert. Um, there's so many categories now. Yeah. Where before, as George said, uh, you couldn't find, a, 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 or art directors said that they yeah. couldn't find uh, a black artist. Yeah, I have lived. Uh, Coretta Scott King Award. I mean, that was something that, in the very early days, not many people had even heard of it. Now, yeah, 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 it, yeah. it brings a certain cachet to a title. The way you know, call the cot if it, if it has that sticker on it, people are going to buy that book. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? George, no, you you um. You, I mean, before we go on, though, before we go, you, so when you ask about what do we see in the industry and what do we hope for, uh, I've, I've lived a long time, generally. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, the days when, I've seen uh, when the trade union movement was thought of as a civil rights movement. There was no civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So I, I've lived a long time, and, and I think that there's something about the way I came into this uh, business that's a little different from the other guys. Although I was one of them who was, I was older than most of the guys, for mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And to me, progress, it, we all have to wonder, what does progress really mean? Mm -hmm. Black people get disappointed because what is progress this year? And, and a little backlash, a little of this, a little of that, and, and we are back where we started. Mm -hmm. So you, progress in, is, is not just being accepted or, 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 or working. Progress is creating our own institutions, our own values. Mm -hmm. is, uh, it's progress it's is it's something that lasts for us that we create. And when I came into the business, I described all the guys who were, who were talented. Our ambition was to get published. Right. There was Random House, there was, uh, you know, Crowell, there were all the others. So we were glad to be published. I personally always felt the way I'm feeling now to you. I had seen the trade union movement go white. I had seen no mention of civil rights at all. And so, and us wishing for civil rights. So when the librarian said, you know, we need uh, 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 black books, to me, black books meant books created by black people, meaning just us books. When you came along in 1988, you had no idea how I was welcoming for it. This is it. Yeah, yeah, We're yeah. gonna create the books. We're not looking for work, right, we're right. working. Right. <laughs> looking for work. I was through looking for work. <laughs> but, you know, when right. you, you mentioned that, I, I want right. to talk a little bit about that because you said you're working and you, going back to what you said earlier, because uh, sometimes we talk about diversity and movement of, of, of increasing the marketplace and getting more black people or people of color into it. But we want to talk about really the craft too, the craft mm -hmm. and the process, because uh, we are not just talking about including bodies of people, but we're talking about bodies of, of work, uh, and, illustrators yeah. who are excellent in watercolor or, or oil painting or woodcut or uh, any number of styles that are there. So what's, what's the, as an artist, as an illustrator, what's your process like? you know, how do you approach illustration? Because now we're in, a, we're in a digital age too now where there's a lot that you can do digitally. Let's yeah. talk about George Ford, the artist, the creative artist in the process. It's a very interesting question because a, <laughs> a lot of it is unconscious. I mean, a, yeah. a lot of it, when, uh, for example, 
uh, I'll, I'll give you an idea. One of the books that you wanted to do was uh, Baby Jesus Like My Brother. Right, right. right. That, 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 now that's a project. Baby Jesus Like My Brother. I'm trying to get the nativity story relating to a black family mm -hmm. or, or black children. Mm -hmm. right. So the first thing you uh, lay out is the way the book will look. And that's part of the craft, but, but in, in a way, in a way, the, the thing you choose to use, the, 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 the medium you choose to use, is often decided by the subject mm -hmm. that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. True watercolor and oil painting are different, and, and the artists are specializing in one or the other. But frankly, if you feel it, mm. and you begin, the, the book decides itself. You, you, what did you decide to use on uh, Baby Jesus Like My Brother? With, with, ba well, with Baby Jesus Like My Brother, I thought to myself, it should be flowing, and it should be, well, it would, it would be watercolor, but it would also be more solid. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, tempera paint, and uh, acrylic paint. Well, that's a personal decision. I, I want to make it a little bit more general. As an artist, you find your own strengths. And, the, and then the way you do it decides itself. Mm. But you, do you, you do thumbnails, uh, George, in terms of laying out the actual flow of the, the story oh, illustrated? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's what you mean. I didn't understand fully. No, no, no. I'm just adding to it. Yeah. Uh, you get the text. <laughs> you get the. This is really interesting. This is interesting. <laughs> no, I got to think about it a minute because it's a lot of it is unconscious. Mm -hmm. Right. When I first, uh, I will deal with that. Since I mentioned uh, baby Jesus like your brother. Like my brother. Okay. It, it begins with feeling. It begins with how you feel about the book. The quality. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that, that's interesting. It is interesting. First, I'll begin where you. We have a lot of. I hope we have time because I'm yeah. really feeling here a little bit. There are two stories here. Mm -hmm. The nativity. Okay. Right. Which is baby born, mm -hmm. significant baby, mm -hmm. drawing the world to him, people coming to him. That's, that's it, 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 the image begins to form in my mind. Right, right. Of this little child, which is a little spot on the page, and everything drawn to it. Mm -hmm. So you want diversity. You want uh, 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 a feeling of the world. So, it's not Jesus, it's a child that you know next door. Mm -hmm. So I immediately I see, let us say we have two pages. I immediately see that on the left, there's text saying, and this happened and this happened, text, print, and in it is the baby and his sister, mm -hmm. the one we know, the girl we know, and her little brother. Mm -hmm. But she's looking to the right, and that so the book begins to take shape. We're going to have a spot on the left showing the, the, the travels of the girl and her boy and her little brother, and on the right, the scene that will be inspired by the nativity, by the it's, George, and so on. But you know, that what you're saying, and, and, and we have we wish we had a lot more time to go into this whole process of talking about how you conceive of an illustration, it's not mm -hmm. just a picture. It's the framework, it's the book, it's the story that tells you how to do it. And even the title, Baby Jesus Like My Brother, it puts it in an urban setting. It puts yeah. it in a setting where, they, where the child can be, it is an African-American child, a black yeah. child, um, yeah. not necessarily a traditional view. So uh, we need a whole nother um, master class yeah. in, in this is and yeah. in terms right. of Really, yeah. the thumbnails, the, the, the flow of the story, the storyboard, and the inspiration that comes really 
from the artist, which makes a picture book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's why it was hard for me to put it into words immediately. But let me say that's uh, going on with what you're saying now. Yeah. All of it comes out about your understanding of the job. You, like I, what we just described is my understanding. And once you understand that it's a parallel between, and it has to evoke the Bible, it has to evoke something bigger than itself. And once you do that, the, the layout that we just described begins to take care of itself. Yeah. So everything starts with your passion. Yeah. With, and then you use your craft to serve your passion. Wow. That's what our and, and your and your and your personal experiences. And, and luckily, if you lived a lot, as I have, you know, <laughs> you, you, you got a lot to draw. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What 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 advice? What advice would you give uh, to those who are interested in um, having a career in publishing, whether as a writer or, or as an illustrator? Whether you're going to be an illustrator or a writer, there are only two things. There are only two things. Read, mm -hmm. read, mm -hmm. read. Because mm -hmm. there's writing, but there's reading. Mm -hmm. There's drawing, but there's reading. You're right. doing books, know something. Mm -hmm. You read everything. I don't read enough. I read, I don't read enough. And I, I, as a young man, before <laughs> I read, no, really, I read everything I do now, I can remember from having read something. Everything you know, it, it goes into that computer and it stays with you. So read and practice, draw. Practice. Right. Practice, yeah. Well, you know, That's what right. we're going to have to do now is kind of go into our uh, lightning, lightning round. round. Yeah. Really okay. quick questions, quick okay. answers. First thing that comes to your your mm -hmm. mind. Um, Brunette, first? quicker than me. Quick. <laughs> you see how long it takes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Burnett, uh, yes, what's the favorite book that you have created? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's a really hard one. Um, Probably it's a it's a book about a bunny, but um, it's called First Snow. It's a picture book. It was published uh, by an English publisher packager that I've worked with. First Snow is probably my favorite of all my books. But on the other hand, I have a new book that was just bought by um, Holiday House. Oh, and right. it's, yeah. it's not even scheduled yet. Okay. Um, but it's called Uncle John's Uncle John's Garden, and um, it's a it's really taken from my own childhood, mm -hmm. uh, my uncle who created this huge garden at the bottom of a pit um, that was dug for the projects in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. They never did build that last building. He got permission to build a garden there, make a garden there. And it's about working in the garden and mm -hmm. growing vegetables. So I'm really, really uh, excited about that book. Great. I don't even know who's going to be the illustrator yet. So we'll see. But it was just signed up. So. What about you, George? What's your favorite book? No, listen, you know something? Um, I'll be I'll honest with you. Well. I have three favorite books. One? Okay. Uh, okay. Three. Two of them you know, and one you don't know. Okay. okay. Bright Eyes, I've been fortunate because these three books have gone and, and opened up the world for me and made me know people that I wouldn't know otherwise. Mm -hmm. Bright Eyes, Brown Skin. It's a Just Us book. It's a Just Us book, but, yep. but I, it was, I enjoyed doing it. And mm -hmm. it looked, I love it. And it's my family that's in it. And I draw <laughs> <laughs> okay. my that's daughter fine. and all that. But that's more, than that, more than that, people, as right now, within the, within the last couple of years, a, a woman who must have been about 30 came to me she she just said, "You George Ford." We're doing a signing. I loved, <laughs> I loved. But that was my favorite book. It happens. It happens all the time. It's been an effective way of reaching black children, mm -hmm. so they remember it. Everybody so, says, so "Oh, book. that was my first." The book. other book I have another. I won't mention the other because that that's that's. that's the other one. I got what are the other two? What are the other two? Yeah. Okay, the story of Ruby Bridges. Yep. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's classic. Yeah. Because of that book, I met Ruby. I met another world. I met her world. Mm -hmm. And she's an icon now. She has taken the place that Rosa Parks used to have. Mm -hmm. Ruby Bridges. Mm -hmm. And I'm there. She knows me. She, she thinks that it's a wonderful thing that the book was done. So that's the second book. The third book is a book which, you, which I'm not going to talk about now. We don't have time. Just tell but, the time. <laughs> we got to get to the next question. <laughs> it's one of the first books I did before I did children's book. 
at a time when it's 1968 book, one of my first books, and it's about 200 pages, and it's called uh, Indian Cultures in the American Pages. I did all the drawing, and some of them were drawings of old, old artifacts in America, Indian Cultures in America, okay. and, and, and it was used by John Henry Clark oh, for, wow. okay. for, for the Latin American studies in Cornell. Okay. And it was 200 pages, and I didn't have done, it was for young people, mm -hmm. but I had three or four books like that, and that no one even knows about, and that was 67 and 68. Okay, so what, 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 is, what is your favorite book written by someone else? Oh, or, or illustrated oh, by someone else? Just the title. Just the, well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, since I, I, there's so many I could have said, and I didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known this, but I, uh, I had occasion to meet Jerry Pinckney in 2010, and he was signing a book that he had won the Caldecott for, mm -hmm. and I had with me a book called Aesop's Fables, mm -hmm. illustrated by Jerry Pinckney, Beautiful. and on the cover is you know the fox and the grapes, right? But the 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 fox is on the cover is a picture of a fox l looking out. And the eyes are kind of watery, and it's a fox. But I said to Jerry, you know something? That's what I've seen those eyes on black men all my life. Your <laughs> animals are black. <laughs> so, so, so I said, I want you to sign this book. This is my favorite book. And Jerry Pinkney signed that book instead of the ones you signed. We call it. So that, that's a nice experience. And Jerry loved that, that story. Yeah. So what about you, Burnett? Oh, wow. It's really hard. I, I love so many books. It's really hard to choose one book that's my favorite. Um, but when I think about, you know, reading to my daughter, and, and my daughter's now grown, you know, 40 some odd years old. I'm not throwing any, I'm not giving anything away. But one of her favorite books was a Pat Cummins book. And I love that book. And it was called Just Us Women. Yeah. And it's just, it's like a perfect picture book. Mm -hmm. Everything about it was perfect. It's like a jewel. Um, gosh, I well, can't think of got, this so many. We got another question. Um, who's influenced you the most? No? Okay. What kind of no, no. Anybody. Anybody. Either one. Yeah, Cheryl who influenced you the most? <laughs> Cheryl Hudson has influenced me the most. That's the person, that's the person I, I admire. That. I can yeah. do that. <laughs> I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about you, George? Yeah. <laughs> Let me see. I, I, I had it on the tip of my tongue. Sure. I'll tell you frankly. I'll tell you frankly. This is the lightning round. <laughs> when, when, when I think of painting or think of trying to produce something, Velasquez. Eric? No. No, Velasquez. Diego. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Okay. I thought you were talking about more current Velasquez. That's right. That, that's the, no, it's, it's really true. It's yeah. really true. I mean, since you asked me, you know, I'll tell you. But, okay. Velasquez painted Pope, I think it was Pope Leo, one of those popes. He went to the Vatican to paint the Pope, and he had this friend, Juan Pereira, Juan, Juan, Juan it's okay. Pereja, yeah, Juan Pereja, was an assistant of his, a black man. And he painted the black man preparing to paint the Pope. And the black man was the, is hanging now, the, the one, one, de, I, one de la pareja, I think it's called. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's hanging in the museum, uh, the, the Metropolitan Museum. And it, at one point, it was the largest money paid for a, for a painting. And it's one of Diego Velasquez's favorite pictures, best mm -hmm. pictures, and it's a black, Man, what year was that? Fifteen something. <laughs> <laughs> so here's our here's our last, my our last lightning round. Question. Wait, wait, wait. Last lightning round. What one thing that you have not had the opportunity to do that you would like to do? What one thing you have not had the opportunity to do that you would like to do? You mean not in art? Any, any anything. You want to know what I want to do? Okay, here's this. <laughs> on, okay, no, this is one I'm, thing, and I'm gonna lightning. do it. The, the other thing I'm gonna do it is my bucket list thing. 
Okay. Like I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm 90, you know why. I, but I still, drive. I still love, I went out in the car today and drove past Brooklyn College, which is closed. Now I can speed past Brooklyn College because nobody's there. Anyway, I love to drive. And I'm going to drive to New Orleans. No. God. Because my daughter's in New Orleans, my granddaughter, and Ruby Bridges in New Orleans. And I want to <laughs> drive down there and surprise all of them. Okay. 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 And I want to drive because I don't want to go down there and then rent a car and spend a fortune. You know, they always say, you can always rent a car. Uh, no, 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 no. no. I'm going right. to drive there. And I'm going to do it. Too. I'm not going with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what about you, Burnett? I did that back in the 50s when we used to drive down to New Orleans with my uncles and my mother, and my father couldn't go. My parents were interracial. My father was white. In those days, that was against the law. Yeah. So my father couldn't go down to New Orleans to see my mother's families. So, um, oh my, I had my experience driving, and they would take turns so that they wouldn't have to stop overnight. And we would get down there like two and a half days, um, that, that's another experience I want to write about, but, um, well, hell, I, I didn't even know that. I, mean, I didn't even know that that happened. Oh yeah, so, more than once. Now I know why I want to do it. Yeah, but listen, guys, I think we're about at the end of the interview. Okay. So we want to thank you for taking the time to chat with us. It's almost like old times, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is more fun than I had in years, I had to tell you the truth. This is really what I'm saying. Thank Listen, you. remember when we used to uh, come to your house? Barbecue, barbecue. But also, we used to spend uh, New, Year's. New Year's Eve. Hey, New Year's That's Day. Right. New Year's yeah. Day. Yeah, yeah, we sure did. New Year's, New Year's Day. Day. We, we used to do that. Almost every year. Did you yes. do it with Ruby yeah. Bridges when she first came? Yeah. 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 I think that was separate. That was a separate yeah. occasion. I don't yeah. think that was New Year's. Not New Year's Eve? No. But we used to always have fun. Yeah. 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 Listen, thank you, you, guys. And uh, we'll see you when this right. pandemic <laughs> is out of the way and we can come to yeah. visit or you guys can come to visit us. Yeah. Yeah. We want to thank okay. our viewers uh, for tuning in uh, to another episode of Just Us and. Um, yeah. Stay tuned for another one because this is a series, an ongoing series. And remember, good, good books make, make a, a difference. difference. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I love it. I love it. Okay.